Five Children and It by E. Nesbitt. Chapter One. Beautiful as the day. The house was three miles from the station. Before the dusty, hired carriage had rattled along for five minutes, the children began to stick their heads out of the carriage window and say, Aren't we nearly there? And every time they passed a house, which was not very often, they all said, Oh, is that it? But it never was. Till they reached the very top of the hill, just past the chalk quarry, before you come to the gravel pit, and there was a little white house with a green garden and an orchard beyond, and Mother said, Here we are. Oh, how white the house is, said Robert. And look at the roses, said Anthea. And the plums, said Jane. It is rather decent, Cyril admitted. The baby said, Wanna go walkie? And the carriage stopped with a last little rattle and a jolt. Everyone got their legs kicked and their feet trodden on as they scrambled out of the carriage that very minute, but no one seemed to mind. Mother, curiously enough, was in no hurry to get out, and even when she had come down slowly by the step and without a single jump, she seemed to wish to see the boxes carried into the house and pay the driver instead of joining in the first glorious rush around the garden and the orchard and the thorny, thistly, briery, brambly wilderness beyond the broken gate and the dry fountain at the side of the house. But the children were wiser for once. It was not really a pretty house at all. It was quite ordinary, and Mother thought it was rather inconvenient and was annoyed that there were no shelves to speak of and hardly a cupboard in the place. Father said that the ironwork on the roof was an architect's nightmare, but the house was deep in the country with no other houses in sight, and the children had been in London for two years without so much as going to the seaside for a holiday. And so the White House seemed to them a sort of fairy palace set out in an earthly paradise. For London is like prison for children, especially if their relations are not rich. Of course, there are shops and theaters and things. But if your people are rather poor and you don't get taken to the theater and you can't buy things from the shops, well then London has none of those nice things that children can play with without hurting themselves or the things. Things like trees or sand or wood or water. And nearly everything in London is the wrong sort of shape, all straight lines and flat streets, instead of being all sorts of odd shapes like they are in the country. Trees are all different, as you know, and I'm sure some tiresome person has told you that no two blades of grass are exactly alike. But the streets in London, where blades of grass don't grow, everything is like everything else. This is why so many children in towns are so extremely naughty. They don't know what's the matter with them, and neither do their fathers and mothers. But I know, and so do you now. Of course, children in the country are naughty sometimes, too, but that's for completely different reasons. The children had explored the gardens and the outhouses thoroughly before they were caught and cleaned up for tea, and they saw quite well that they were certain to be happy in this little house. They thought so from the moment they found the back of the house covered with jasmine, all tiny white flowers that smelled like a bottle of the most expensive perfume ever given as a birthday present. And when they saw the lawn all green and smooth and quite different from the brown grass of London, and when they found the stable with a loft hanging over it and some hay left over, they were almost certain. And when Robert found a broken swing and tumbled out of it and got a lump on his head the size of an egg, well, then they knew for certain they were bound to be happy. The best part of all was that there were no rules about not going places and not doing things. In London, almost everything is labeled, you mustn't touch. And even though the labels are often invisible, it's just as bad because you know they're there, and if not, you will jolly well soon be told. The White House sat on the edge of the hill, with a wood behind it and a chalk quarry on one side and the gravel pit on the other. Down at the bottom of the hill was a level plain with strange-shaped little buildings, where the people burnt lime and a big red brewery and other houses. And when the big chimneys were smoking and the sun was setting, the valley seemed to be filled with a golden mist, like an enchanted city out of Arabian Nights. Now that I have begun to tell you about this place, I feel as though I could go on and make the most interesting sort of story about all the ordinary things the children did, just the kind of things you do yourself, you know. And you would believe every word of it. And when I told you about the children being quarrelsome, as you are sometimes, then perhaps your aunt might find the book and write in the margins in pencil, Oh, how true, how like life. And you would see it and be very annoyed. (laughs) 
so I will tell you the really astonishing things that happened. And then you can leave this book lying around and feel quite safe that your aunt is not going to write oh how true in the margins of this book. Grown-up people find it very difficult to believe really wonderful things unless they have what they call proof. But children will believe almost anything, and grown-ups know this. That's why they tell you that the Earth is round like an orange, when you can see perfectly well that it's flat and lumpy. And why the Earth goes around the sun, when you can see for yourself any day that the sun comes up in the morning and goes to bed at night like a good sun should, and the Earth stays still. Yet, I dare say, you believe all of that about the Earth and the sun. And if you can believe that, then you will believe that before the week was out, Anthea and Cyril and the others found a fairy. At least that's what they called it, because that's what it called itself. And of course it would know best. But it was not like any fairy you have ever read about in a fairy book. It was in the gravel pit. Father had gone away suddenly on business, and Mother had gone away to stay with Granny, who was not feeling very well. They both left in a great hurry, and when they were gone, the house was dreadfully quiet, and the children wandered around from room to room, desperately wishing for something to do. It was Cyril who said, I say, let's make for the gravel pit. We can pretend it's a seaside. Father says it was once. He says there are shells there that are thousands of years old. And so they went. Of course, they had been at the edge of the gravel pit and looked over, but they had not gone down into it for fear that father said they mustn't play there. And the same with the chalk quarry. The gravel pit was not really dangerous. As long as you don't try to climb down the edge and go the safe, slow way round the road. Each of the children carried their own little spade, and they took it in turns to carry the lamb. He was the baby, and they called him Lamb because the first thing he ever said was, Bah! The gravel pit was very large and wide, with grass growing around the edges at, at the top, and dry, stringy wildflowers, purple and yellow. It looked like a giant hand wash basin. The children built a castle, but of course, castle building is rather poor fun when you've no hopes of watching the tide come rushing in and filling up the moat and washing away the drawbridge. Cyril wanted to dig a cave and place smugglers in, but the others thought that it might collapse and bury them alive. So it all ended with spades going to work to dig a hole down to Australia. For these children, you see, believed that the world was round, and that on the other side there were little Australian boys and girls who walked the wrong way up like flies on the ceiling. The children dug and dug and dug, and their hands got sandy and hot and red, and their faces got damp and shiny, and the lamb had tried to eat some sand and cried most terribly when he found out it was not brown sugar. And he was cried himself out and was laying asleep on the warm sand in the half-finished castle. This left his brothers and sisters free to work really, really hard, and the hole was to coming out to Australia was going rather well, when Jane suddenly begged the others to stop. Suppose the bottom of the hole were to suddenly give way, she said, and you tumble out among all the little Australians and get sand in their eyes. Yes, said Robert. Then they would hate us and throw stones at us and not let us go to see kangaroos or possums or emus or anything. Cyril and Anthea knew that Australia was not quite so near as that, but they agreed to stop using the spades and go on with their hands. This was quite easy because the sand was fine and warm and dry. Fancy there having been a sea here once, all sloppy and wet with fish and eels and coral and mermaids and ship masts and Spanish treasure. Oh, I wish we could find some golden doubloons or something, said Robert. How did the sea get carried away? Robert asked. Well, not in a pail, silly. Father says the earth got all hot like you sometimes do in bed and it kicked off the sea like you would kick off the covers. I say, let's go look for shells or something. That cave over there looks likely and I see something over there that looks like a ship's anchor. It's terribly hot here in the Australia hole. The others agreed, but Anthea went on digging because she always liked to finish things once she'd begun and she thought it would be a disgrace to leave the hole without getting through to Australia. The cave was disappointing because there were no shells and the wrecked, sh and the wrecked anchor turned out to only be the broken off handle of an axe. And the cave party was just making up their minds that it was time to go home for some lemonade when Anthea suddenly screamed, Cyril, come here! Oh, quick! It's alive! It'll get away! Oh, hurry! 
It's a rat I shouldn't wonder, said Robert. Father says they infest old places, and this place must be pretty old if the sea was here thousands of years ago. Perhaps it's a snake, said Jane, shuddering. Let's look, said Cyril, jumping into the hole. I'm not afraid of snakes. I like them. If it's a snake, I'll tame it, and it'll follow me everywhere, and it'll sleep around my neck at night. Oh, no, you won't, said Robert firmly, for he shared a bedroom with Cyril. But you may keep it if it's a rat. Oh, don't be silly, said Anthea. It's not a rat. It's much bigger. And it's not a snake. It's got feet. I saw them. And fur. Oh, don't use the spade. You'll hurt it. Then it'll bite me, said Cyril, seizing up his spade. Oh, don't. Please don't, said Anthea. I know it sounds strange, but it said something. What? It said, you let me alone. But Cyril merely observed that his sister must have gotten very hot in this heat. And he and Robert began digging with the spades, while Anthea sat on the edge of the hole, jumping up and down in hot anxiety. They dug carefully, and presently everyone could see that there really was something moving in the bottom of the hole. Then Anthea cried out, I'm not afraid, let me dig. And she fell on her hands and knees and began scratching like a dog. Oh, I felt fur, she cried. I did, I really did. Then suddenly, a dry, husky voice in the sand made them all jump back, and their hearts leap nearly as fast. Let me alone, it said, and now everyone could hear the voice, and looked at the others to see if they had too. But we want to see you, said Robert bravely. <laughs> I wish you would come out, said Anthea, taking courage. Oh well, if that's your wish, the voice said, and the sand stirred and spun and scattered, and something brown and furry and fat came rolling out of the hole and the sand fell off of it and it sat there yawning and rubbing its eyes i believe i must have fallen asleep it said stretching the children stood round the hole in a ring looking at the creature they had found it was worth looking at its eyes were on long horns like a snail's eyes and it could move them around like telescopes it had ears like a bat's ears, and its tubby little body was shaped kind of like a spider, but covered in thick, fat fur, and its legs and arms were furry like a monkey's. What on earth is it? said Jane. Shall we take it home with us? The thing turned to look at her. Is she always talking nonsense? He passed a scornful gaze over Jane's hat. Or is it that stupid thing on her head that makes her act so silly? She doesn't need to be silly, Anthea said gently. Well, we none of us do. Whatever you may think, oh, don't be frightened. We won't hurt you. Hurt me, it said. Frighten me. Upon my word. Why, you talk as if I were nobody in particular. All its fur stood out like a cat when it was going to fight. Well, said Anthea, rather kindly, Perhaps, if we knew who you were in particular, we could think of something to say that wouldn't make you cross, because everything we seem to say has made you mad at us. So, please, who are you? And don't get angry, because we really don't know. You don't know, it said. Well, I know the world has changed, but really? You mean to tell me? Seriously, you don't know a Samiade when you see one. A Samiade? That's Greek to me. It's Greek to everyone, the creature said sharply. Well, in plain English, I'm a sand fairy. Don't you know a sand fairy when you see one? It looked so grieved and hurt that Jane hastened to say, oh, Well, of course I see it now. It's quite plain, now that I come to look at you. You came to look at me several sentences ago, it said crossly, beginning to curl up again in the sand. Oh, don't go away. Do talk to us some more, said Robert. I didn't know you were a sand fairy, but I knew distinctly the moment that I saw you, you were the most wonderful thing I had ever seen. The sand fairy seemed a shade less disagreeable after this. It isn't talking, I mind, it said, as long as you're reasonably civil. But I'm not going to stand here and make polite conversation for nothing. Perhaps I'll answer you, perhaps I won't. Now say something. Of course, no one could think of anything to say, but at last Robert thought of, so how long have you lived here? And that's what he said. Oh, ages. Several thousand years, replied the Samiade. Oh, tell us about it, do. It's all in books. But you aren't, said Jane. Oh, tell us everything you can about yourself. We don't know anything about you, and you're so nice. 
the sand fairy smoothed its long rat-like whiskers and smiled. Please do tell us, said the children all together. It is wonderful how quickly you get used to things, even the most astonishing things. Five minutes before, the children had no idea that there was any such thing in this world as a sand fairy, and now they were talking to it as though they had known it their whole lives. It drew it in its eyes and said, Oh, it's very sunny, isn't it? Quite like old times. Where do you get your MAGA theorems from now? What? The children said in one voice. It can be very difficult to remember that what is not always the most polite thing to say. Our pterodactyl is plentiful now, the sand fairy went on. The children were unable to reply. What do you eat for breakfast? The sand fairy said impatiently. And who gives it to you? Eggs and bacon and bread and milk and porridge and things. M Mother gives it to us. What are Magger uh, what's its name and Perry? What did you call them? And does anyone have them for breakfast? Why, almost everyone eats pterodactyl for breakfast in my time. Pterodactyls were kind of like crocodiles and kind of like birds. I believe they were very good grilled. You see, it was like this. Of course, there were heaps of sand fairies then. And in the morning, you would wake up, and you'd find them, and you'd get your wish. And people used to send their little boys down to the seashore early in the morning to get the day's wishes. And very often, the eldest boy in the family would be told to wish for Magatherum. They were as big as an elephant, you see, and there was a good deal of meat on them. And if they wanted fish, it was Icheothorus that they asked for. He was 20 or 40 feet long, and there was plenty of him. And for poultry, it was the Peleosaurus. There were nice pickings on that one, too. And the other children could wish for other things. But when people had dinner parties, it was always Magatherums or Icheothorus, because there were fins were a delicacy, and the tails were good in soup. There must have been heaps and heaps of cold meat going to waste, said Anthea, who was of housekeeping mind. Oh no, said the Samian. That would never have done. Why, of course, at sunset, whatever was left over just turned to stone. You find the stone bones of the Magatherum all over the place, or so they tell me. Who tells you? asked Cyril. But the sand fairy frowned and began to dig very fast in the hole. Oh, don't go away, they cried. Tell us more about what it was like with Magatherum for breakfast. Was the world like this back then? It stopped digging. No, not a bit, it said. It was nearly all sand where I lived, and the coral grew on trees, and the periwinkles were as big as tea trays. You find them all turned to stone now. We sand fairies used to live at the seashore, and children used to come with their little spades and pails and make castles for us to live in. That was thousands of years ago, but I hear children still build castles in the sand. It's difficult to break yourselves of the habit, I guess. But but why did you stop living in castles? asked Robert. It's a sad story, said the Samiad gloomily. It was because they would build moats around the castles, and the nasty wet sea would come in, and of course, as soon as a sand fairy gets wet, we catch a cold, and usually we die. And so there were fewer and fewer of them. Whenever you found a fairy and had a wish, you used to wish for Magatherum and eat twice as much as you wanted because it might be weeks and weeks before you got another wish. Did you ever get wet? Robert asked. The sand fairy shuddered. Only once, it said. The end of my twelfth hair on the top of my left whisker. I feel the place in damp weather to this day. It was only once, but it was quite enough for me. I went away. As soon as the sun dried my poor little whisker and scurried away to the back of the beach and dug myself in deep and warm, dry sand. And I've been there ever since, and the sea moved its lodgings, which is perfectly fine by me. And now I'm not going to tell you another thing. Oh, just one more question, asked the children. Can you give us wishes now? Of course, it said. I gave you your first one already. You said I wish you'd come out, and I did. Oh, please, might we have another? Yes, but be quick about it. I'm getting tired of you.
I dare say, you've often thought what you would do if you had three wishes given you, and you have despised the people in stories who waste their wishes, and feel certain that you would think of three really useful wishes without a moment's hesitation. These children often talked this matter over, but now the chance has suddenly been given to them, and they couldn't think of anything. Quick now, said the sand fairy crossly, but no one could think of anything. Only Anthea managed to remember a pride little wish she and Jane had once had but they'd never told the boys about. But still, it was better than nothing. I wish we were all as beautiful as the day, she said in a hurry. The children looked at each other, and each could see that the others were not any better looking than usual. The Samiaid pushed out its long eyes and seemed to be holding its breath. It swelled itself up until it was twice as big and suddenly let out its breath in a long sigh. I'm afraid I can't manage it, it said apologetically. I must be out of practice. The children were horribly disappointed. Can't you try again? They asked. Well, said the sand fairy, the fact is, I was keeping back some strength to give the rest of you some wishes. But if you'll be content to have just one wish a day among the lot of you, I dare say I can make myself do it. You agree? Oh, yes, said Jane and Anthea. The boys nodded. It stretched its eyes out further and further, and swelled and swelled and swelled. Or, I hope you don't hurt yourself, said Anthea. Or crack your skin, said Robert anxiously. Everyone was very much relieved when the sand fairy, after getting so big that it almost filled up the entire hole, suddenly let out its breath and went back to its proper size. That's right, it said, panting heavily. It'll come easier tomorrow. Did it hurt much? asked Anthea. Only my poor little whisker, thank you, it said. But you're kind, thoughtful children. Now, good day. And it scratched itself furiously with its hands and disappeared into the sand. The children looked at each other, and each child suddenly found itself alone with three perfect strangers of radiant beauty. They stood for a moment in perfect silence. Each thought that its brothers and sisters must have wandered off, and that these strange children had walked up unnoticed while it was watching the swelling form of the sand fairy. Anthea spoke first. Excuse me, she said very politely to Jane, who now had enormous blue eyes and red hair. Have you seen two little boys and a little girl anywhere about? I was going to ask you the same thing, said Jane. And then Cyril cried, Why, it is you! I know that hole in your pinafore. You are Jane, aren't you? And you're Anthea. I can see your dirty handkerchief that you forgot to change when you hit your finger. Oh, crikey, the wishes come off after all. I say, am I as handsome as you are? If you're Cyril, I liked you better before, said Anthea decently. You look like the picture of a young choir boy with golden hair, and you're so pretty you're bound to die young. And if that's Robert, he looks like he's got oil in his hair. It's completely black. You two girls look like angels from a Christmas card, the silly ones that adults send each other, said Robert. And Jane's hair is simply carrots. It was indeed the kind of Venetian tint so admired by artists. We'll find no use finding fault with each other, said Anthea. Let's get the baby and lug it home for dinner. Servants will admire our beauty most wonderfully. The baby had just woken up, and they found he was not any more beautiful looking than before. I suppose he's too young to have wished naturally, said Jane. We shall have to mention him specifically next time. Anthea ran forward and held out her arms. Come to Anthea, ducky, she said. The baby looked at her disapprovingly and put a sandy thumb in his mouth. Anthea was his favorite sister. Come on, then, she said. Go away, said baby. Come to Janie, said Jane. Want my Janie, said the baby dismissingly. Oh, come on, then. It's me, Robert, said Robert. Come and have a yakety yak on Robbie's back. No knacky knack boy, howled baby, giving away altogether, and then the children knew the worst. Baby didn't recognize them. They looked at each other in despair. It was terrible in this emergency to meet not the friendly eyes of their brothers and sisters, but the dazzling perfect eyes of these strangers. This is most awful, said Cyril. He had tried to pick up Lamb, who had scratched like a cat and bellowed like a bull. We have to make friends with him. I can't believe I have to make friends with my baby brother. But that's exactly what they had to do.
It took over an hour and was not rendered easier by the fact that Lamb was by this point hungry as a lion and thirsty as a desert. At last, he consented to be carried by these strangers home. But he refused to hold on, and so was complete dead weight and was most exhausting to carry. Oh, thank goodness we're home, said Jane, staggering through the iron gate to where Martha, the nursemaid, stood at the front door, shading her eyes with her hands and looking anxiously. Oh, here, do take baby. Martha snatched the baby from her arms. Oh, thanks be his safe, she said. Where are the others? And who, goodness gracious, are you? We're us, of course, said Robert. And who's us? Where's your home? asked Martha. I tell you, it's us. We're as beautiful as the day, said Cyril. I'm Cyril, and these are the others, and we're jolly well hungry, so please let us in. Martha merely looked at Cyril with impertinence and tried to shut the door in his face. I know we look different, but I'm Anthea, and we're so tired, and it's long past lunchtime. Then go home to your own lunch, whoever you are, and if you our children put you up to this play acting, you can tell them from me. They'll catch it when they get home. Cyril rang the bell violently, but no one answered. Presently, the cook put her head out the bedroom window and said, If you don't take yourselves off, I'll fetch the police. And she slammed the window shut. It's no good, said Anthea. Oh, do come away before they send us to prison. The boys said that it was nonsense, and that no law in England said that you could put someone in prison for being as beautiful as the day. But all the same, they followed the others out into the lane. We should be our proper selves at sunset, I suppose, said Shane. I don't know, said Cyril. It may be like that now, but things have changed a good deal since Magatherum times. Oh, cried Anthea suddenly, perhaps we turn to stone at sunset, like the Magatherums did. She began to cry, and so did Jane. Even the boys turned pale. No one had the heart to say anything. It was a horrible afternoon. There was no house near where the children could beg a crust of bread or even a glass of water, and they were afraid to go down into the village because they had seen Martha go down there with a basket, and there was the local constable there as well. True, they were as beautiful as the day. That's poor comfort when you're hungry and thirsty. Three times they tried in vain to get the servants of the White House to let them in. And when Robert went alone, hoping to climb in through an open window, but all of the windows were out of reach, and Martha emptied a toilet jug of cold water on top of him. Go along with you, you nasty little monkey. It came at last that they were sitting in a row under the hedge with their feet in a dry ditch waiting for sunset and wondering whether the sun did set. Would they turn to stone or would they be their old selves? Each of them felt so lonely among strangers and tried not to look at the others. I don't believe we shall turn to stone, Robert said, breaking the silence, because the sand fairy said he'd give us another wish tomorrow. And he couldn't very well do that if we were stoned, now could he? The others said no, but they weren't really comforted at all. Another silence, longer and more miserable, was broken by Cyril suddenly saying, I don't want to frighten you girls, but I believe it's beginning with me already. My foot is dead. I'm turning to stone. I know it. And I will be in a minute. Oh, never mind, said Robert kindly. Perhaps you'll be the only one who turns to stone, and the rest of us will be all right. We'll cherish your statue. But it turns out that Cyril's foot had only gone to sleep because he was sitting on it too long. And when it came to life again with the pins and agonies of little needles, the others were quite cross at him. Give us such a fright for nothing, said Anthea. The third and miserable silence was broken by Jane. If we do come out of this all right... We'll ask the Samiade to make it so that the servants don't notice anything different, no matter what we wish for. And the others all agreed. At last, hunger and fright and crossness and tiredness in the four children all joined together to bring about one nice thing, sleep. The children lay asleep in a row with their beautiful eyes shut and their beautiful mouths open. Anthea woke first. 
to find that the sun had set and twilight was coming on. Anthea pinched herself very hard to make sure that she wasn't stone. And then she pinched the others in turn, and they too were soft and lumpy. Wake up, she said, almost in tears of joy. It's all right, we're not stone anymore. And Cyril, how nice and ugly you look with all your freckles and brown hair and your little beady eyes. Oh, so do you all, she said, so that no one would feel jealous. When they got home, they were very much scolded by Martha, who told them all about the strange children. A good-looking lot, I must say, but very impudent. I know, said Robert, who knew by experience how hopeless it would be to try to explain things to Martha. And where on earth have you been all this time, you naughty little things? Oh, we were in the lane. Well, then why didn't you come home hours ago? We couldn't come home because of them, said Anthea. Who? The children who were as beautiful as the day. They kept us until after sunset. We couldn't come back until they were gone. And you don't know how we hated them. Oh, do give us some supper. We are so hungry. Hungry? I should say so, said Martha angrily. Out all day. Well, I hope you learned a lesson. And you not go picking up with strange children. Probably have measles, as likely as not. Now mind, if you see them again, don't you speak to them? Not one word. Not so much as a look. But you come straight to me, I'll spoil their beauty for them. If we ever do see them again, we'll tell you, said Anthea. And Robert fixed his eyes on the cold roast beef being brought out by the cook and said, and we'll take jolly good care that we never do see them again. And they never did.